Whether it's a sports car you're excited to rev up for a nice weekend drive, or a safe minivan filled with entertainment features for your children, cars are everywhere. There are more than 275 million vehicles on the road in the United States. People, they equate cars with freedom. There is this way in which it gives us an ability to explore and see and expand our lives. But in recent years, owning a car has gotten expensive, really expensive. More than 100 million Americans have an auto loan, and auto loan debt in the U.S. is currently at $1.5 trillion, a record high. Outside of purchasing your first home, a new car or an auto is the second largest purchase for most people. Given the transaction prices and vehicle prices today, financing is required to buy these vehicles. In 2023, the average monthly auto loan payment for a new vehicle is $725, up from $650 in 2022. The average monthly payment for a used vehicle is $516 in 2023, up 2% from the prior year. Meanwhile, consumers don't typically cast their car buying experience in a positive light. It was a very quick process, and I did feel like they just wanted me to sign at the, the bottom line as quickly as possible. For years, complaints and lawsuits have been popping up left and right against lenders for alleged discriminatory and illegal practices. It undermines my trust. Our number one priority is to our consumers. And so we have put a variety of processes in place to ensure that is the case. So what's happening in the auto loan industry and what can consumers do to make sure they're protected? Just like any other loan, an auto loan is a lump sum of money you're given to purchase a car. Money you're borrowing and have to pay back over time. Once you've been approved for a loan, often including a down payment, you can drive your newer used car out of the lot. But it's only yours as long as you make monthly payments. With interest, of course. Take 32-year-old Sean Miller, for example. In 2019, he bought a new car for just more than $48,000. He put down about $10,000, locked in a 3.89% interest rate for a 72-month term, and now makes monthly payments of about $590. By the time the loan is paid off, he'll have paid nearly $5,000 in interest. And then there's a caveat. Until you fully pay back the loan, the lender holds the title and can repossess the car at any time if you fall behind on your payments. Noelle Saldana was at work when her husband called to say their 2011 Acura had been stolen right in front of their East Orange apartment building with their one-year-old daughter Hannah in the back seat. Just got back to working. I um, got a little behind in my payments. Repo guys going into your driveway in the middle of the night and taking your car. That's one way. They have these um, switches that can turn the cars off. There are direct and indirect lenders. A direct lender would be your local bank, credit union, or an online lender. Once you're approved for a loan through a direct lender, you can then head to the dealership and shop around for your car just like a cash buyer would. As for indirect, that's when you go to a dealer and they provide you with financing options as you're buying a car. For example, you might be at a Subaru dealer and you just picked out the perfect car for your family. The dealer sends your financial information to Chase. Chase checks your credit and other financial factors and provides the dealer with an interest rate and loan terms. Then, the dealer presents you with their interest rate and terms and, if you agree, you sign and get to drive away with your new car. It's more of an all-in-one process, and about 80% of auto loans are estimated to be indirect. Now, regardless of if you're choosing a newer used car or direct or indirect lending, one of the most important factors that will determine the interest rate and loan terms you're offered is how confident the lender is in your ability to pay back that loan. They look at your assets, liabilities, income, expenses, and most importantly, your credit score. Our primary goal is to put customers in financial products that they can afford. Chase Auto tells us they service consumers with a credit score of 620 and higher, with the average credit score typically in the 700 range. Toyota Financial Services holds primarily a prime credit portfolio, meaning they service those with very high credit scores. They tell us the average is 744. But we do support a larger spread of business. And those with maybe lower FICOs may come to the table with larger down payments to help that affordability. Toyota is currently the market leader for auto loans and leases. In 2022, 5.3% of total auto financing came from Toyota Financial Services. 4.4% came from Capital One Auto Finance. The partnership that we have with the divisions 
is what makes us extremely successful. Um, we've got a concentration and a focus on our customers and our guests and our dealership partners. According to Toyota, the company's financial services business consists primarily of providing financing to their own dealers and their customers. The business also provides mainly retail installment credit and leasing. Sales revenue for the financial services business for fiscal year ending in March 2023 increased by nearly 21% to 2,809.6 billion yen from 2022, which is about $19.8 billion. That's compared to its much larger automotive operations business that saw an 18% increase in sales revenue in 2023 from the year prior. The Japanese automaker is the largest in the world. The industry is going strong. Uh, we're, we're continuing to recover. Consumers are out there buying vehicles. The demand is there and the lending is there. They are losing their jobs and these firms are going to go out of business and he's nuts. Global chip shortage still hampering car production. The rate of inflation soaring to its highest level in over 30 years. More than half of auto financing is by non-bank finance companies such as the financing arms of automakers. These lenders typically rely on short-term funding markets for their own financing. So with volatile markets, especially the case of short-term funding markets drying up during the global financial crisis, the past couple of decades have kept auto lenders on their toes, to say the least. We went from a time of easy credit to now a time where we're more credit constrained and because of the risk of inflation, even more credit constrained, right? Because of the interest rates that have gone way up. That is a huge problem. In the first quarter of 2023, the average interest rate for a loan on a new vehicle reached 6.58%, up from 4.1% in 2022. That's an about 15 year high. Average car prices are also at a high. That's partly due to supply chain shortages, higher demand and inflation. That also means Americans take on larger loans at a higher interest rate. In the past 10 years, outstanding loan debt has doubled, and auto loan debt in the U.S. is at a record high. Younger Americans are also more in trouble than they've ever been in. In 2022, $20 billion in Gen Z and millennial debt had fallen into serious delinquencies. I'm paying a ton of money right now uh, for a car that I don't really need. I've been struggling and struggling to sell it. If I were to sell it today, it would probably be a, a ten to $15,000 loss. Miller rented his car out until someone crashed it. He's tried to sell it, but hasn't received an offer that makes financial sense. It's gonna be at least another three or four years of owning the car before I'm able to pay off the loan. This is something that right now is preventing me from being able to save up in order to start a family. He's not alone with his concerns, and these changes are hitting lower income consumers, those with credit scores below 620, the hardest. The Fed's interest rate hikes are squeezing them out of the market. What we're seeing is another manifestation of what we saw during the subprime crisis, which is that lower income people lost their homes and lower income people are having difficulty getting cars, getting mortgages, um, and they're also at higher risk of default. Being priced out of the market is just one reason Americans have a bone to pick with the auto loan industry. Besides the notoriously unpleasant car buying experience, there's also been more complaints and lawsuits related to alleged discriminatory and illegal practices by auto lenders than we have time to get into. A lot of the auto salespeople um, that I've seen personally, uh, not to say all, but definitely a lot of them are doing it very much in a rush way in order to get a high markup on a car, in order to get a great commission, but not with the interests of the buyer, not with their financial livelihood, and not with their family um, in mind. Remember that indirect lending example I gave you earlier with Subaru and Chase? The bank, or in that example, Chase, provides an interest rate and loan terms, and then the dealer, or Subaru, presents you with their interest rate and terms. That's often with the markup. The consumer never sees how much the finance company has said is the minimum interest rate and loan term that they will accept. Let's say, for example, Toyota Finance says that they want the minimum interest rate to be 7%. The dealer can bump it up to 9% and the consumer never knows about that transaction. It violates all of our norms about fairness and about the way markets work. It's a convenience the dealer is providing, offering a service by arranging financing. That markup becomes profit for the dealer and is sometimes shared with the lender. 
Chase and many uh, financial institutions do put limits on how much of a premium a dealer can add to the rate that we offer. Putting limits ensures consistency of experience um, across a variety of distributors. Chase Auto did not provide us with what its current caps are. Caps on markups vary based on state and lender, but are typically around 2.5 percentage points. Lack of transparency is just one, but a common reason some consumers feel they're being treated unfairly. One of the more recent controversies was this one. The Massachusetts Attorney General reached a $7.6 million settlement with Toyota Motor Credit Corporation to resolve allegations of illegal auto loan collection practices. The lawsuit claims Toyota failed to give certain consumers sufficient information about the calculation methods for deficiencies left on their auto loans after their cars were repossessed. I can't comment on that settlement. We stand firmly that you know our practices are very fair. Um, you know, to be specific, Settlements and fines, I really can't comment um, because of the specificity of the state allegations and what might be behind it. Back in 2016, a different settlement. That time, for $21.9 million to settle allegations that Toyota discriminated against Black and Asian borrowers by charging them higher rates than white borrowers. And Toyota is not alone. I think probably all the major car manufacturers have been hit with lawsuits like this because of the discretionary decision making when it comes to the markups. Toyota wouldn't comment on that settlement either, or this report, spanning the entire industry by a former senior economist at the Federal Reserve Bank of Chicago. It claims Black, Hispanic, and Asian borrowers often pay hundreds and sometimes thousands of extra dollars in loan payments relative to their white counterparts. Do you have any insight into why that might be? No, that is something I cannot on all of our risk-based pricing is based off of FICO score and credit worthiness of the customer. We don't even collect uh, that type of data. That report is not nearly the only one with such claims. According to this research paper, minority borrowers pay 70 basis point higher interest rates, but default less than non-minorities. These researchers say each year, more than 80,000 minorities are unable to get loans that they would have been approved for if they were white. Whenever people have subjective decision-making, that's where the lack of transparency is very problematic. We spend a lot of time making sure that we understand um, and are providing affordable lending products to all consumers, uh, regardless of their background. A class action lawsuit was filed in 2017, alleging Chase Auto violated the Fair Debt Collection Practices Act and state law, by illegally repossessing consumers' vehicles from April 2013 to 2018. In 2018, Chase Auto, its parent company J.P. Morgan Chase, and debt collector Repossessors Incorporated agreed to pay $3.25 million to settle the case. What has Chase Auto done since then, and have business operations changed to prevent future allegations? We um, undergo a variety of uh, tests of our systems and processes to ensure that they are compliant with all rules and regulations. And there have been a series of exams and reviews of our process, and we feel confident that we are compliant with applicable law and regulations. For the first time in more than a decade, in 2022, the FTC proposed a rule addressing unfair and deceptive financing practices by auto dealers. The proposed measures include banning bait and switch claims, fraudulent junk fees, surprise junk fees, and requiring full upfront disclosure of costs and conditions. I've dealt with predatory lending. Multiple members of my family have also dealt with predatory lending in some very sketchy situations. And it's really in our best interest to have some rules in place to make sure uh, that you know these unscrupulous auto lenders aren't taking advantage of people. But in July 2023, the U.S. House Appropriations Committee backed a government spending bill containing language that blocks the FTC from implementing its proposed new rules. So what does that mean for consumers? It means new legislation is probably not around the corner. In the meantime, consumer advocates say more programs are needed to protect Americans buying cars. And that increasing transparency is key. My mother always knew how much bananas cost at every grocery store and went to the store that had the cheapest price. When it comes to cars, we don't have that ability. Do you believe a consumer should be able to see the rate directly from Chase, regardless of whether or not they're you know, getting pre-approved at home prior to going to the dealership, or if they're sitting in the dealership and that's the first time that they're trying to get an auto loan? Yes, I think that transparency is critical. And so 
if a consumer goes to chase.com, they can see the rate, they can see the terms, uh, and they should be able to see the rates and the term at the dealership or whatever they uh, get their financial uh, uh, loan from. Until we see changes in the industry, Americans need to look out for themselves. Before getting an auto loan, experts recommend shopping around. Check your credit score, get pre-approved online, go to your local credit union and bank, and find out what types of deals you might be able to get before signing anything. Right now, we're finding that the lowest interest rates are with the credit unions. Average rates within credit unions are closer to the 6% range, whereas the banks are closer to 7 and 8%. We now have digital marketplaces online. There's a wide range of resources now that are available to help customers understand the competitiveness of the interest rates, the terms that they're getting. Arm yourself with the best information possible. In 2020, Toyota launched SmartPath, a digital retail tool that lets customers shop for cars and apply for financing online. This concept of living room to showroom, so that when customers and guests are online researching what kind of vehicle they want, they can have a similar and transparent process. If you have the means, drive to a second, third, or maybe fourth dealer to compare rates and terms. And stay away from buy here, pay here dealers. They typically offer the highest interest rates, sometimes up to 20%. Do your research, ask questions, and don't give up, even if it's been a long, exhausting, and mentally draining day. We all know the feeling of not wanting to see one more number, but don't let that push you to sign on the dotted line if you're not ready. Tell the dealer you need more time, and you'll come back. Finally, vote. There are tremendous problems and tremendous solutions. And those solutions are only gonna happen if the politicians who are making decisions about federal law in particular are willing to take consumers into account. And until we can get politicians to commit to protecting consumers, we're not gonna have solutions.